Hello and welcome. My name is Caroline McGraw with The Clearing. The Clearing is a residential dual diagnosis addiction treatment center located in Friday Harbor, Washington. And we specialize in helping people to discover and heal the underlying core issues that drive addiction. And today we are so honored to be speaking with Dr. Peter Coleman. Welcome, Dr. Coleman. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. The Coleman Institute provides incredibly high quality outpatient detox programs. They have a 96% satisfaction rating and 98% of their patients complete detox successfully. So we're honored to have you here today. Thank you. Well, Dr. Coleman, you've written about how you struggled with addiction yourself from a young age. Can you talk about some of the underlying issues that really led you to start drinking and using? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good question. I'm 61 now, and I've been in recovery 32 years. Wow. Um, yeah, it's been a fun life, uh, and it's you know my mother was an alcoholic. I didn't have any idea about that when I was growing up, but um, when I started struggling with my own addiction, I sort of well when I got into recovery, I sort of realized. She really mm-hmm. did drink too much, and that caused a lot of fights with my dad and stuff. So, you know, but I was a bit of an overachiever as a kid, and I really wanted to be a doctor. And, uh, you know, I went off to med school, and I, I kind of partied like other people, like other kids. And um, I just like doing it more than most of my friends. And so I sort of escalated from drinking alcohol and would get pretty drunk and smoke pot, and then. Eventually, I got into cocaine, and because that became a big thing in the 80s, and then ended up getting into even morphine and and using IV drugs, and had a drug overdose, and went to treatment. And mm. fortunately, I was forced to go to treatment for like four months because I was a doctor, and they said, "Well, if you don't go, you'll never work as a doctor again." And that got my attention because mm-hmm. I had no clue that I really had an addiction problem. I really thought I was just having fun and being a scientist and trying this and trying that and you know and in truth I'd been suffering from a long for a long time and and when I finally was able to get all the drugs out and really look at how my life was I realized how painful how much pain I'd been in Mm. Um, and you know I stayed there long enough to be able to learn how to stay clean and sober and change my life enough to you know, to be able to maintain that. So it's been really fun. And so to think about it, I I believe that most people have a genetic vulnerability for addiction, that a lot of people try alcohol and drugs, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and some people just don't like them that much, and I did. And my brother's alcoholic, and uh, my uncle's alcoholic, and just think that that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, it was just normal experience, a childhood sort of experimentation. But I'm also aware that most people, including me, have quite a lot of deep-seated underlying sort of trauma and um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of low self-esteem, and so those drugs and alcohol kind of filled the hole a little bit with not feeling good enough, maybe not having enough friends, wanting to be popular, you know, having some depression and stuff. Um, so those things need to be taken care of during your recovery so that you're not tempted to go back. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. Um, So, in your own words, how did you go about founding the Coleman Institute? When did you decide to create the program? Sure. Well, part of my recovery, part of my treatment program was four months, and the last three months of that I had to do volunteer work. And the program was set up to do volunteer work in a kind of a field that would be helpful to you and so they put me in a detox center so I worked with a Dr. Mm -hmm. Mark Holt and I started detoxing people under his care and I loved it it was just fun seeing people get off drugs and start getting back on on track Mm -hmm. and I looked up to Dr. Holt he was just one of the most wonderful men I've ever met and people the patients loved him the nurses loved him and I loved him and and he loved me I mean and he sort of took me under his wing and Mm -hmm. and at that point you know, part of the program is to sort of figure out what's your path in life? What is it that you want to be doing? What, right. what flips your switch and, and is, you know, almost a mission? And, and, and for me, helping people get clean and sober was what sort of clearly came to mind. And so 
I, 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 I left that program, went and did a fellowship in addiction medicine, and have really been working in, in the field ever since. And then in 98, this big heroin and opiate crisis sort of happened. So I learned how to detox people, and I've been doing that really well and successfully since then and, and seeing a lot of people get clean and sober. So, Wow. That's, yeah. That's so amazing how your process of getting clean led you to the path of, wait a second, I want to help other people do this, and this is, yeah. this is what yeah. really flips my switch, like you said. Yeah. Um, so also, I guess I want to ask, how does your experience with having been through detox and been through addiction yourself, how does that influence what you what you do in the program? Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. It's it's what I do. It's uh, it's what I love doing. It's what I'm good at doing. It's what I feel led to be doing. Patients enjoy the fact that I can relate to them on that sort of level. Of course, sure. I don't think that's absolutely necessary but it does help mm -hmm. um, it's a joy I mean to see people get clean and sober I mean we see enough people not everybody unfortunately maintains long-term sobriety addictions you know a difficult thing to stay in recovery you know forever and yet I believe that everybody can if they work hard enough at it you know in in the 12-step philosophy we say you've got to be willing to go to any lengths you've got to be willing to put a hundred percent into it and you know that means doing what you're told it means sitting through some discomfort it means you know paying attention learning new things learning new tools learning how to deal with stress and emotions and all of that stuff because life is stressful and guess what those things are going to come up and you know temptations are going to come up so yeah that reminds me of one of the things we'll often say in our program is that you have everything you need to heal inside of you and that you have the tools and you know if you're willing to make that choice that it's possible for you to do Absolutely. yeah and and you've got to do it I mean you can't just talk about it you've got to actually do it you can't say oh I'll do anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I mean I had a patient this morning an alcoholic guy that's probably going to be dead and I gave him six months but my nurse practitioner said I don't think he'll last that long because his liver's already oh, wow. shot and I said he said, I'm willing to do anything. I said, okay, then do these things. He said, oh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, like, how can I help you? <laughs> you're not willing to do anything. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's sad because, you know, it's like he's got a terminal illness that, you know, like cancer. If he had cancer and I said, okay, there's this one drug that's going to save your life. It's the only thing. Mm -hmm. You know, he would take it. But when, but when that one thing is going to treatment program, he won't go. Hmm. It's crazy. Wow. That is <laughs> fascinating. Man. Yeah. Um, so I also wanted to ask, what are some of the, the myths that you encounter most often in your work? Like, you, you did a video recording that I really enjoyed you know, on your website talking about how a lot of times people think that addiction is just about a lack of willpower and how that's not the case. No. I, it's, it's, if, if it was just a matter of willpower, you know, everybody would stop as soon as they had that one thought, like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to stop smoking, you know, whatever it is. Um, no, it's deep-seated in the brain in terms of those compulsions, and, and those are all tied in with your memory circuit, so you get triggered with any little thing that, that reminds you of how good that felt when you did use drugs or how much relief you felt from anxiety or from stress. Mm. Um, you know, the opiates that we use are really powerful emotional painkillers, and so they're not just yes. physical painkillers. And it's emotional pain that most of us have, you know, more often than not, and we've got to learn how to deal with that. But the, I think the biggest myth is that, um, that it's just the drug, that I'm just addicted to this drug. Ah. And if I could just get off this drug, my life would be fine, because that's what it yes. looks like. Yes. You know, they, the patients come to us and they think, oh, I'm hooked on this heroin or on oxycodone, Percocet, whatever it is. And if I just didn't have to go get that, I know I could do it. Mm. And it's so much deeper than that. You've got to get those drugs out, but then you've got to learn how to deal with stress, how to deal with anxiety, with loneliness, with boredom, with all these emotions that we don't like. Yes. You've got to learn and you've got to be willing to change enough things about your environment that you're not triggered, that you're not reminded of it. It's like trying to be on a diet but work in a cookie factory. You know, I mean, that's not going to work. There's yeah. no way that's going to work. 
you might make it for a month or two, but you're not that powerful. No one is. Hmm. So you can't work in a cookie factory. So find another job. <laughs> That's the thing. There's lots of other jobs out there. You know, but people don't get that. They think it's going to be easy, mm. and it's not. That's so profound because even if a person hasn't struggled with, you know, a substance addiction, I can certainly relate to the idea of my life will be fine as soon as this is taken care of. Absolutely. It's like, no, it's oh. easy to believe that, but it's not that <laughs> it's simple. It's very easy to believe that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just much deeper than that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious too, you mentioned all the, the various drugs that people come in, addicted to heroin, oxycodones, all of these. Um, is there one particular addiction that you see the most often in your center? Um, we, we, we mainly do opiates. We, mm -hmm. you know, we also do some alcohol. Of course, you don't really need to detox off cocaine or methamphetamine, so we don't tend to see those people for detox, but we do see some of them who are struggling with long-term recovery. But mostly we do opiates, mm -hmm. and of those, about 20, 25% are maybe chronic pain patients who were put on mm -hmm. the drugs because of their physician, and it was legitimate but they kept taking it too long and the doctor didn't supervise them stopping taking it. Right. Uh, so that's a big issue. Uh, about half of the others are, well maybe 30% are, are on oxycodone or pain pills that they're just buying from friends. Another 30 odd percent are heroin, that they've now switched to heroin because it's cheaper right. and effective. Right. And then we see a lot of people who have been taking methadone or suboxone and mm -hmm. they are on this long acting drug to help keep their brain stable while they learn how to stay clean and sober and now it's time to get off of that and so we can detox them off that over eight days and you know if they've done a good job building up their recovery program and, and getting over some of that you know, early trauma or, or other lifestyles that need to be changed, mm -hmm. then they can do really well. But they still need to switch to the naltrexone mm -hmm. uh, so that they don't relapse back to drugs because that post-acute withdrawal, it's going to take about a year for the brain to fully heal. That makes total sense. Yeah. Yes. Well, when we've had participants come to us, we've definitely heard some horror stories of detox centers where folks have really not been well looked after. Right. So I know often when people come to our site, they want to learn more, they want to prepare themselves because we don't offer detox as part of our program. We, we, know, we have people detox before they come to us. Sure. So if people are, are looking for a program investigating detox centers, what should they really look for in a detox program? Um, so there's a number of ways to detox, you know, if you want to do it outpatient, the most common way is to just switch to Suboxone and then wean off that as you tolerate, but unfortunately it's still pretty painful and a lot mm -hmm. of people just get hooked on the Suboxone or the Methadone if you're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, I used to run a Methadone clinic and we would do it, had a 21 day program where we would put people on Methadone and then wean them down slowly. But we only had about 5% of people completed because during that 21 days, almost everybody relapsed. Wow. Um, so now we do this outpatient detox where we get people off of it in three days. We sedate them fairly heavily, give them a lot of comfort meds, mm -hmm. and then we actually push the drugs out with the naltrexone. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to trick the brain to heal a little bit faster than it would. And okay. it gets them over and done with. You know, and it's uh, people psychologically do better when they know it's going to be done in three days. They, they yes. want to put up with, you know, and they've got a support person with them so that they're, you know, they can't just change their mind and go out and use some drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, other people detox inpatient and that can be helpful. Um, you know, if the nurses and the doctors are giving you enough medicines to keep you comfortable and you're in a safe environment, that can be helpful. It's a little bit more expensive, but um, you know, it can be also very effective, but some people will run away from that as well because sure. they just don't feel good. So that's a great point, and I I had that farther down the list of inpatient versus outpatient, and you illustrated it perfectly that there are benefits and drawbacks to each approach, and some people might feel claustrophobic at the idea of an inpatient yeah. approach, whereas others might really want that extra support. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, so what is a realistic cost range? I know it obviously varies depending on insurance and everything, but for that, maybe that just that three day intensive detox. You know, the, the cost on ours is somewhere between six and seven and a half thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is a little expensive, but it's over and done with quickly. And, you know, we, like you said earlier, we have like 99% of people complete the detox and get onto naltrexone. Right. Um, so compared to going into an inpatient rehab for 28 days, it's pretty inexpensive, although we're not doing the rehab piece of it. Exactly. Um, but that's that's about what it is for us. You know, it's it's an investment for sure, mm-hmm. but to mm-hmm. the fact that it's a, you know gets it over and done with and uh, and it's you know it's successful, then uh, um, you know I think it's a good investment. And, and honestly, a lot of our patients are using that much in a month or two of of heroin anyway. So that's a very good point. They're spending that much anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so also. Just to clarify, is that so that three day period is the accelerated opiate detox program, correct? Correct. Okay, so if people yeah. are searching on your website, that's what they should yeah. look for. Yeah, and that includes the naltrexone implant or the Vivitrol, mm-hmm. so that they're then protected from any relapse uh, for the first month or two, uh, and their cravings usually go away. Most people say their cravings go away completely, uh, mm-hmm. so that's pretty nice that they can then concentrate on on their therapy come to you or you know some other place like that or do an outpatient uh, you know rehab awesome well do you find that people are often very apprehensive or afraid of going through detox and if so why where does where is that fear coming from well only a hundred percent of the time (laughs) only a hundred percent (laughs) yes yeah because everybody's tried stopping Mm -hmm. mm-hmm You know, I mean, it's like cigarette smoke, because I mean, everybody's tried quitting at some point. Uh, and with heroin or opiate, I mean, they, they don't want to be on the stuff. They hate the stuff. They they, mm-hmm. they know it makes them feel good, and they'll go eight hours, and they start feeling some withdrawal. And if they go 12 hours, it's more. Mm-hmm. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so they've all tried that, and they know exactly. And a lot of them have been in five different detoxes, and never completed one of them. So everybody who comes to us is terrified. Mm. Uh, and so we spend a lot of our time reassuring people, um, you know, that it's going to be okay, that we, you know, you're going to be okay. We, we talk to patients on the phone before they come mm-hmm. uh, with both our screening people, but also the doctor gets on the phone. And, and that helps to reassure people that, you know, they're going to get through it. And, and we can confidently say, hey, look, we get 99% of people through this. It's going to be okay. We've been doing this for since 98 really so really wow. 19 years so we know what we're doing we've done it a long time and we're really good so mm-hmm. you know that reassures people and it gives them the confidence and and very quickly after they come to us we give them some comfort meds and they feel better you know they sure. typically sleep a lot the first day so they come back on day two and they're like well i just slept all day yesterday <laughs> so it wasn't bad. right and i can handle a that more day to go you know mm-hmm. so Hmm. So it's uh, it's it's pretty nice. Well, that's perfect. I was just about to ask to walk us through the three day detox. So day one is sleeping okay. a lot. Okay. Then day two it is, is really, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah, so people on the phone and talk to them, and then they stop their their drug use the day before, like at six o'clock. Okay. And then we'll see them early the next morning. So they've gone you know, maybe 12, 14 hours, but they do that almost every day anyway, so they know they can do that. Okay. And then we do a history and physical and get some labs and an EKG and stuff, and we give them some meds in the office, and it's not unusual that within 45 minutes they're already asleep mm. uh, and feeling much more comfortable. We give them a little Neltrex and a little shot in the arm uh, to just push some of the drugs out, but just such a small amount they don't really... Most of the time, they don't even notice that. Okay. Um, and they go back to the hotel or to their to their house with their support person, and they come in on day two, mm-hmm. and we adjust their meds a little, and we give them a bit more naltrexone and let them go home. And then on the last day, we they come in early in the morning uh, with uh, NPO. They haven't had anything to eat or drink, like they're going to have like a medical procedure. Mm-hmm. And then we put an IV in, and we give them increasing doses of medicine to push the drugs out. And usually they don't feel too bad. And by one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, they're up and about, and they're 
done. They finished, all the drugs are gone, and so then we can put them on naltrexone. It's really, it's really pretty amazing. Wow. So, yeah. That is such a stark contrast to. I recently wrote a blog post about you know aversion therapy and the lengths that you know people will go to often to you know try and get clean and. This sounds right. much less painful on so many levels. Oh, it's, wow! It's I, you know we've had a number of patients who have who have been really happy, and then their family like, are you sure this isn't going to make it too painless? Uh-huh. You know <laughs> that they might relapse. Oh, I see. And, I see. You know I understand that fear, but no, I don't think anybody relapses. You know, the time they're about to use heroin again, they say, oh. I'm not going to do this because I'll have to go through withdrawal again. That's not what they're thinking about at all. I don't think so, so either. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's not, not what causes relapses. Yeah, That's a really good point because that's another myth maybe that if you have this really painful withdrawal, then maybe then you won't use again. But that's exactly. not. Exactly. That if that was true, women would never have a second baby. <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> Very good point. Yes. But no, the memory, the brain is just set up to 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 downplay pain, and you know, and and it, that's not what causes relapses. You know, mm-hmm. if that was true, then no one would ever go off their diet. They would remember how bad they felt when they were thirty pounds heavy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they just had that extra cake or that coffee or whatever. At the point that someone makes the decision to to do that again, have one more cookie or something like that. Then you know they're they're not thinking. Oh boy, this is definitely going to happen. There, you know, that's the the brain just doesn't think that way. Right, right. Is it more like I just want to alleviate the discomfort I'm in right now? I just don't want to feel this. Either that, or I want to get the pleasure and the thrill that that I want right now. I want that mm-hmm. to feel good. I want that. You know, I, I mean, it's. I think most people can relate when you put it in a food thing. I mean, most people, yes. you know, have have thought I shouldn't really eat that extra piece of cheesecake and then they've thought well I'll just have a half of a one or you know <laughs> that'll be worth it and yes. they downplay the negative consequences they they say oh well I'll work out again tomorrow or I'll mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it won't really make any difference uh, yes. and with food you can do that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when it comes to heroin you can't because once you do that one mm-hmm. time you're going to be back doing it again like cigarette smokers almost never you know, go back to just having one here and there. Hmm. That's such a good point that the rationalizations that work in one area of life don't right. carry over into other areas. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, this is this has been so helpful, and I I want to honor your time. But any final words of advice or encouragement, uh, people who are thinking they might be ready for detox, but they're scared. Well, it's not just ready for detox. It's ready for recovery. Mm. You know, I, you know, I, I see people clean and sober all the time who mm. have had horrible diseases. I'm a member of International Doctors in AA, and you know, we have conferences with like 500 physicians, and to be mm. there around that many people who have had serious problems. I mean, horrible diseases, hurting people, their families. Mm. And they're all happy. They're all doing well. They're all helping others. They're all living a happy life. I mean, that's available to all of us if mm. we work at it. You know, that's the key. You know, people people need to be ready to work at it. You can't you can't get something for nothing. You've got to be willing to surrender to it. You've got to be willing to accept that this is your problem. It's not anybody else's. Yep. It's your job to do something about it. You know, and then you've got to work at it. And working at it at times is easy mm-hmm. because it's like riding a bike. I mean, after you've learned how to do it, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. You just ride your bike, and then you can see more things in the world and experience more things because you can ride a bike than before. But if you're too afraid to learn how to ride a bike because it's too wobbly and it might fall off, then you're not going to learn it. So you've got to have the courage to do that. Mm. And then, you know, the world opens up and you realize, wow, I wish I'd done this a bit sooner. You know, my mother ended up getting sober, oh, you know, wow. for the last 10 years of her life. And she she said to me, boy, I meet these people who are sober at age 25 and, you know, she said, I'm 70. I wish mm. it had happened a bit sooner. Not that I can go back and regret the past, but, you know, 
I mean, she had a lovely 10 years of her life, and I see it all the time. So if anybody's thinking they can't do it or it's too hard, mm-hmm. don't buy that. Yeah. That's not to say you can't, you don't have to put work in, you do. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but it's incredibly worth it. So that's my last uh, <coughs> words of advice and wisdom. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. It's hard work, but on the other side, you it's can incredibly have worth it. an amazing life and it is. recovery is worth it. It's it's the life I think, you know, we were meant to lead and, and it's where happiness really is. You know, I we all you know, people that I know we we, 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 we thought we wanted to be happy mm-hmm. and we found drugs and alcohol and it looked like it was happy, but it wasn't. It was just a dopamine rush in the brain. It was a pleasure mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. was there and then it's gone. You know, and you're actually a little emptier than you were before. Mm. because happiness wasn't there ever so if you're looking for that to bring happiness it's not there so but it is in here if you just lead the right life you know if you and putting drugs and alcohol in your brain how are you ever going to get it with that yeah. it's impossible so <clears throat> yeah. well it has been a delight to talk to you and thank you for all that you do yeah thank you thanks for uh, putting this together and and for all you guys do, you do it. Guys do a nice job at the clearing. You know, I've heard some good things, and I think a lot of people can really benefit from the kind of work that you do. So thank you. Thank you.